I published a lengthy investigation traversing the various relationships which apparently allowed <clears throat> the CIA uh, under Mike Pompeo, who is now Secretary of State, to contract with UC Global through a third party, uh, which was Las Vegas Sands. This is the company of Sheldon Adelson. And for those of you who might not know, and I, I'm sure there are only a few of you, if any, uh, Sheldon Adelson is one of the most prolific donors to Donald Trump's political empire. He's also a benefactor of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and is essentially a representative of Netanyahu and the Israeli Likud party's interests in the United States. Adelson is a casino billionaire, one of the top 10 wealthiest people in the United States. And he has really two interests. Number one, expanding his uh, financial empire, uh, expanding his ability to have casinos in any country that will allow them. So uh, Las Vegas and Macau in Chinese territory are his two main bases of operations. And number two, um, his, the number two on his agenda is um, allowing Israel to expand. Uh, it's thanks to Sheldon Adelson's money that we see the deal of the century come to fruition. Uh, which will put to bed the Palestinian national question uh, with the annexation of Israeli settlements. Palestinians call it the steel of the century. And Jared Kushner, the presidential son-in-law, is close to Adelson. So it's unusual that Adelson would, would demonstrate an interest in someone like Julian Assange, who's not really associated with Palestinian advocacy. Um, and what I think took place here was that Adelson was able to, um, for example, help the political career of Mike Pompeo, who is himself an ultra Zionist, a Republican from Kansas, he's a Christian Zionist, get him into the CIA um, and assist the, assist the national security state as he expands his financial empire. Um, I drew a connection between Sheldon Adelson's work on behalf of the CIA and FBI uh, in the past and what current what took place uh, around the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Um, it was actually some an article reported first by The Guardian in 2015 relating to an operation that took place at Adelson's Las Vegas Sands in 2010 in Macau, where according to a private intelligence report produced by gambling competitors of Adelson, the CIA was operating out of Las Vegas Sands, monitoring Chinese officials who were blowing lots of money on, you know, at the card tables. Um, they would approach these officials and seek to blackmail them into becoming informants, classic blackmail operation. So there, it, there seems to be a long running relationship between the CIA and Adelson's operations. But during, in 2016, when Donald Trump became the presidential front runner, the relationship intensified and it took place when David Morales or sort of um, it, it began when David Morales, the CEO of UC Global, went to a security fair in Las Vegas um, to a convention center owned by Sheldon Adelson. Morales, you know, was a small time player. He only had the Ecuadorian embassy contract and the contract to guard the children of Rafael Correa. But he had someone very important, as we all know, inside the Ecuadorian embassy. So when he went to the security fair, he was approached, apparently, according to um, the documents that I obtained through this court case in Spain, by the executive vice president of Sheldon Adelson's um, security team. His name was Zohar Lahav. He is an Israeli American. And as soon as Morales returned from this fateful trip to Las Vegas, he began bragging to his employees back in Southern Spain that we will from now on be playing in the first division using a you know, soccer metaphor, a football metaphor. That meant, you know, according to Morales' business partner, that the Americans will find us contracts around the world. Um, so what was this contract? The contract was technically to guard Sheldon Adelson's $70 million yacht, which is called the Queen Miri, named after Adelson's wife, Miriam, 
it's the most, um, I think, expensive yacht in the world. And so the funny thing about the contract was that Adelson already had a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week security team to guard his yacht, to guard his family. They followed him everywhere, and Lahav oversaw the whole thing. So why did he need David Morales? The reality appears to be that the CIA of Mike Pompeo needed cover for an operation which Stefania accurately described as a dirty war. And we know what took place around the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, so it was basically Adelson's security team providing the cover, acting as a third party. And, and, and you know, if, you, if you're familiar with the way C the CIA or other intelligence agencies run black operations around the world, they often rely on friendly oligarchs or friendly billionaires to kind of give them the money up front, give them the cover. But this one was a little bit different because you had Zohar Lahav actually kind of running the operation on a day-to-day -day basis. I obtained phone logs uh, from Morales's phone, text messages, emails that show him kind of in constant contact with Lahav. And I've subsequently acquired documents that show that they were very close friends. Then there's another figure, um, Deepa actually um, wanted me to emphasize this uh, figure who's very, um, you know, pre previously unknown, but very influential, um, who is w the head of global security for Sheldon Adelson. His name is Brian Nagel. And it appears that Brian Nagel was involved in this operation to um, install the cameras in the Ecuadorian embassy that recorded not just um, visual video material, but sound as well, and to deceive the Ecuadorian security services, Sinaín, um, by setting up a separate server for those that Morales referred to as the American friends. So quickly, who is Brian Nagel? Aside from working for Sheldon, for Sheldon Adelson, he was the assistant director of the US Secret Service. The U.S. Secret Service is usually associated with, you know, grim bodyguards who speak into their sleeves while they're wearing aviator glasses and guarding the president. Um, but they don't just guard the president. They are the top cybersecurity agency in the U.S., and that is thanks to the work of Brian Nagel. Um, after 9-11, starting in the late 90s, Nagel set up the agencies or the, the, the outfits that would bring at the FBI, US intelligence services, private cyber experts, you know, companies like HB Gary, for example, might have been involved to fight what they called cyber crime. Um, Nagel was awarded by the CIA with a medal for his work in setting up these agencies. And these same um, agencies would have been on the front lines of the US effort to take down WikiLeaks when it came online in 2010. Nagel retired in 2008 and went to work for Adelson. So he seemed like the perfect person to work hand in glove with Mike Pompeo's CIA to manage an operation like this. And so you heard Stefania talk about having her backpack searched, um, you know, having her phone open. This happened to every journalist who visited. But this part of the operation where you see Global posing as just the embassy security would break into all of the sources, all, uh, the phones and computers of all of the sources and journalists who came to visit Julian Assange and particularly his lawyers. It really came to a head in December, 2017. What was taking place in December, 2017 was that Julian and his legal team were beginning to discuss a plan to allow him to exit the embassy under the Vienna conventions um, to get him diplomatic immunity from a friendly country, a friendly third party. And this set off alarm bells back in Washington. Uh, Morales was instructed to start following everyone, not just in the embassy, but outside the embassy. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, they were instructed to set up a separate feed on the cameras uh, that would allow the Americans to see. 
and to be, get to get really aggressive with the guests, which Stefania experienced. So basically, um, Morales, and this is the part where the relationship with 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 Sheldon Adelson really uh, becomes clear. He was summoned at this time to Las Vegas Sands personally for a special session with the American Friends. And on December 10th, David Morales sent a series of emails from a static IP address. I mean, I have these emails from Adelson's Venetian hotel to his spy team back at the embassy. And he said, nobody, first of all, he said, nobody can know about my trips, mainly my trips to the USA, because Sinaiin, the Ecuadorian security service, is on to us. He was like, don't say anything about me being in Las Vegas to anyone around the embassy. And then he um, provided his spy team at the embassy with special instructions that came in the form of a PowerPoint presentation written in perfect English. Morales is a Spanish speaker, although he speaks English as a second language, he could not have composed this. And the PowerPoint instructed his employees on how to create a login system so that the Ecuadorian security services would not notice that there was a second user with a separate security login. That separate user was obviously the CIA. And this was the material, the, this was the technology they wanted to use to spy on Julian as he was meeting with his lawyers to concoct this uh, plan to legally exit the embassy. So it seems like there was only one person who would have been at Las Vegas, who was handing down personally with Morales in his physical presence, these instructions. And to me, that kind of person was Brian Nagel. So just to, to kind of close here, I think it's important to just de detail what happened in December, 2017, because this was really kind of, I think the end of one chapter where Julian could have actually left the embassy and this saga would have ended and he could have gotten diplomatic immunity with a country like Serbia or Bolivia, for example. But he didn't. And it was precisely because of this spying operation. So people who were visiting Julian were targeted. Even his friends, Pamela Anderson, the Canadian American actress was targeted and her Gmail password was stolen and her email was apparently invaded. We know what happened with Stefania and other journalists. Their phones were broken into. Um, Stella Morris uh, was targeted not just at the embassy, but outside the embassy. She was Julian's lawyer, but also as the mother of his two children. And apparently the US intelligence services were obsessed with this issue. And one of Morales's workers was ordered to steal a diaper from one of the infant children who were visiting Julian at the embassy with her and to connect it to Julian through DNA. Um, it was interesting because there were no instructions to obtain Julian's DNA, which meant they already had it somehow. Uh, but then they realized that you can't get DNA from feces. The worker approached Stella Morris outside the embassy and said, you know, this is insane what we're doing. I can't take it anymore. Uh, just keep your child away from the embassy. And so there was clearly an indication that they were being spied on. Julian was using white noise to speak to his lawyers. So they, uh, the UC Global put a magnetic microphone under the fire extinguisher. Julian would speak to his employees in the women's bathroom and turn on the water to try to uh, counteract the spying mechanisms. And so they put a new camera in there. Uh, everything was done. And then uh, when the plan was finalized, the head of Ecuador's Senaín Security Services visited the embassy to put in place the final parts of the plan. He, too, was spied on. His phones were opened. Everything that he said was recorded and sent back to the Americans, which is just an, a, a, it's, it's an absurd crime. And Todd Chapman, who was the U.S. ambassador to Ecuador actually began threatening Ecuadorian officials not to carry out this plan. And those officials began to wonder, how do they know about this? Like, how do they know what's even taking place? I was told 
by someone who was intimately involved with this plan to allow Julian to leave the embassy, that an Ecuadorian official who was also involved in those plans, upon returning to Quito, was robbed at gunpoint in a official government car by two men on a motorcycle. They took nothing but his laptop, which contained details of the plan, and drove away. And this is not the only robbery attempt uh, that took place in this whole operation. And so ultimately the plan was foiled. Two days uh, before the plan was supposed to be executed in a court in um, Northern Virginia, just a few miles from where I'm sitting, uh, U.S. prosecutors introduced a secret indictment of Julian Assange as a direct result of this. So you can draw a direct line between the secret indictment of Assange and the spying of him at the embassy. Um, I, I, I think I'll wrap it up here, but um, so many people who were around Julian at this time and around the embassy were targeted with criminal activity. And there, um, some of them are going to be filing criminal complaints or have filed criminal complaints in a Spanish court, including the employees of UC Global. That's how we know about all this. That's how I know about all this was that the employees of David Morales ultimately concluded that they were not comfortable with what they had been ordered to do, that it was criminal. One of them called it treasonous and said, we were working for the enemy, referring to the Americans. They went to Julian's lawyers. Julian's lawyers went to a Spanish judge. The Spanish judge enacted an um, operation to ultimately arrest Morales, and they obtained all of these company backup emails, phone logs, and so on. And it's thanks to this Spanish case that we know about this titanic uh, criminal operation that spanned the globe. And I, I can tell you with confidence that we are going to learn a lot more in the coming weeks and months. Thanks very much, Max. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, could I also ask another quick question about the same uh, uh, case? And that is, um, you mentioned briefly in uh, your article about uh, the not only surveillance, but the uh, misinformation um, that uh, UC Global were um, involved in. Could you say something briefly about that, please? Thank you. Um, when you maybe I'm unclear about the question. I, I think it was a report. Uh, they were um, cr uh, generating false reports about what was happening in the embassy. Is that is that correct? Um, maybe I read that somewhere I else. Might be, uh, missing that that part. I mean, I, I'm aware that I mean there was you know if you if you go back if you read my article and you go back to the reporting by uh, characters like Luke Harding and The Guardian. And uh, you know, he was working with uh, Fernando Villavicencio in Ecuador, who is just basically uh, an agent of the Ecuadorian opposition. Uh, you know, if you look at the reporting of CNN, you will see just straight up falsehoods, uh, which claim that it was not the US spying on Julian Assange, it was actually the Ecuadorian government. And it was the Ecuadorian government that was upset. And they were claiming that, you know, he was basically running this Russian hacking operation out of the embassy. So I think, you know, there was a concurrent uh, operation of, of misinformation and disinformation being run in order to provide cover and give interference to the Americans while they were uh, waging their dirty war on Julian and his uh, and his sources, lawyers, journalists, and friends. So this is really, uh, the, I don't know if this is the misinformation that you're referring to, but if you read this article, it just explodes every other article that was you know, used to defame and attack Assange and attempt to link him to Russian hackers. Um, and the, main, the main issue here is that um, UC Global's contract was technically, publicly, with Ecuador's Senayin security services. They were given the contract because Senayin officials could not uh, easily travel back and forth into the Schengen zone, into Europe um, to provide security themselves. But UC Global was an EU company based in Spain. 
they already had the contract with uh, Correa's children. And so that's why they ultimately were approached by the CIA. But the, they were violating their contract with Ecuador and secretly working for the Americans via Sheldon Adelson. And none of the reporting up until this Spanish case, which was initiated in late 2019, none of the reporting acknowledges this. It's all false. And it all claims that all of these images that we see of Julian meeting his friends and everything that was learned was gathered by the Ecuadorians. That's just false. So that to me is mis the, 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 the worst piece of misinformation. And now that, by the way, I mean, now that I've I've published this and laid it all out there for everyone to see. Uh, where's the mainstream media? Where is corporate media on this? I mean, I understand that they're privately very interested in this, but I mean, if you look on Twitter, no mainstream journalist dared to touch this story. Uh, none of them corrected the record. None of them updated their stories, which were previously false. And that to me is a separate scandal about how the media has treated the criminal operation run against Julian Assange, which is to simply more or less ignore it. 